So this has really led some to conclude that the concept of national competitiveness is an outmoded notion. Now let's look at China. China right now is under a lot of, I think, rightful attack, as it were, from the US and the EU and Canada, and I hope others, around about their indigenous innovation policy. Have many of you heard about this? This is now where they're basically saying that their procurement and all their domestic growth needs to be driven by indigenous innovation. That means that all the tech transfer, all the innovation that US, European, Canadian companies have put into China to create now their champions, they're going to, in effect, protect and utilize that and make it very difficult for us to participate in that market. It's something, you know, I have to say, I predicted a long time ago, um, and it was something that you could see actually with a company like Motorola, who was very proud of the fact, you know, that they were working with China some years ago on uh, analog cell phones. Well, you know, the forced technology transfer in China and the whole way the government operates that system, once they built their champions, of course, Motorola had no market share, and really China just became part of their platform in their um, global assembly work. But countries compete against each other, and let's not forget this. They compete for the wealth-generating engines of global investment, business assets, and jobs. And all of these investments, assets, and jobs have to be looked at in the context of the high value and what do we do in the ecosystems where we live, where we have our children, to ensure that we have a higher piece of that global competition. And this, again, is why this partnership between government and the private sector is absolutely critical, because we have to create the optimal policies and balance between what the government can do and what the private sector must do in order to create the high value inside our economies. The fourth trend, very, very important, first time in human history, we have real-time global labor arbitrage, 24-7, around the clock, global labor arbitrage. There are incredibly skilled, talented people all over the world competing for jobs every minute of the day and night. And we say at the U.S. Council, it's easier to ship work around the globe in bits and bytes. In fact, if work is routine, if it's rule-based, if it can be digitized, there's going to be a low-cost source of labor somewhere in the world to do that work. You cannot compete for those jobs. And that is why even in China and India now, you're seeing that the labor issues, the labor cost issues, are no longer the differentiator differentiating factor where a lot of the assets are going because of 24-7 real-time labor arbitrage. The fifth shift, and one in which the U.S. and Canada have tremendous needs and assets and reasons to collaborate together very, very closely, is that we are in the midst of a profound technological revolution. The digital, the biotechnological, and nanotechnology revolutions are rewriting the rules of production, services, and life in digital code, in genetic code, and atomic code. Just think about that. Digital code, genetic code, and atomic code. Just in the last two weeks, we heard that Craig Ventner has synthesized for the first time an artificial living cell. Huge implications for new businesses, huge implications for human health, huge implications for everything we're thinking about on this earth as human beings. These are going to be the platforms for new industries, for new markets. They're going to unleash vast, vast opportunities for innovation. Now let me talk a little bit about nanotechnology. Alberta is a leader in nanotechnology. This is one of your great R&D strengths. Nanotechnology is going to bring about a new design and manufacturing paradigm. It's going to affect every material, electronic, structural, biological, medical. We're going to be able to create products with functionality that would have been impossible. Let me give you a couple examples. A flexible suit that hardens when impacted by a knife or a bullet or compresses around a wound. Lux research predicts that 2.6 trillion in manufactured goods will incorporate nanotechnology by 2014. 
That's 15% of the total global output. Nanotechnology will revolutionize the treatment of disease, and it will revolutionize agriculture and our, our ability to feed the world. Multidisciplinary fields are just reeking, ready to go with these new developments. We have bioinformatics, agroenergy biotechnology, biomaterials, and digital animation. Biomimicry is an incredibly fascinating area, and I'll just share one example of this. Qualcomm has a new display, the Murasol display, that mimics the way butterfly wings and peacock feathers cause light to interfere with itself, creating shimmering, iridescent colors. There's a new company called Sharklet Technologies that has antimicrobial films that are now being used in hospitals to prevent infections. And where do they come from? From the millions of tiny diamond shapes that are arranged in a pattern that mimic the microbe-resistant properties that sharks have. A fantastic example of biomimicry. The sixth area is the link between high-value, game-changing innovation, the blending with manufacturing and services, and the incredible importance of intangible assets. If a nation loses the know-how to manufacture things, the nation will lose the know-how how to develop and design things, and will lose its ability to innovate. Developing leading-edge products from thin film PV solar cells and carbon composites and electronic paper for displays is inextricably linked to the manufacturing know-how. And I will say that from my time in the government back in the um, early 90s, the biggest heartache I had, I spent my time, my heart and soul, working on the U.S. flat panel display industry when I was Assistant Secretary of Commerce. We invented in the United States every single path of displays, liquid crystals, plasma, field emitters, on and on and on. We never commercialized one, we never built them, and the entire value stream, the jobs, and the next generation innovation all left the United States. Huge implications for national security as well. Because we did not have the capital cost structure and the industrial structure and the risk to take these technologies to full scale production. And the Japanese and the Koreans and the Taiwanese did. The link between manufacturing and innovation is only going to increase with science-based manufacturing for nanoproducts, smart materials, and biopharmaceuticals that I've already alluded to. We're going to see how things are being made now, already beginning with things like the self-assembly of materials, with intelligence built into materials, using modeling and simulation and supercomputing to actually design and simulate the manufacturing and supply chain of things in a way that has never been done before. And this is why the next big initiative of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness is our U.S. Manufacturing Competitiveness Initiative, which we're launching on June 23rd. We're going to create an entire new understanding of what manufacturing is. In fact, we'd like to create new words for it if we can. If any of you want to participate, we would love this, because manufacturing is, doesn't tell what's going on. When I was a government official, I have to share this with you, a Japanese, uh, very senior official from then, Nitty, came to me and said, we have to talk about the four Ds. And I kept thinking, well, what are these four Ds? And, and uh, finally, I got the courage to say, well, what are the four Ds? Because I thought, I must really be you know, missing something. He said, manufacturing, manufacturing, four Ds. Manufacturing, dirty, dumb, dangerous, and disappearing. 